So today, it's basically all been about, I have a trait of interest. I want to ask if some pattern about that trait is unusual. So I could simply have divergence data. We could use the test to ask, is the pattern of divergence excessive relative to what I know about the effective population size and the time and the heritability? I could have a time series data. I can ask, is that time series internally consistent? Or is there a directionality? Or is it switching too much? Then I went to the second category of tests, where I use markers. But the markers are basically to give me a common value for a given population, this trait independent. So I take a, take a bunch of presumably neutral markers and use those to compute an average FST and then apply that value to all the traits I look at. And what I then do is I contrast that for the QST, the partition of within versus between genetic variation for my trait of interest. So if I have a, a set of populations, I compute one FST, maybe I then compute QST values for 20 traits. So again, the key idea is I'm using the trait, in this case, how the genetic variation of that trait is partitioned, and contrasting that to uh, how I expect a neutral marker to be partitioned. So entirely trait-based. So trait-based plus some external information, which would be T, N, E, H. That's the first set. Number two, trait-based based just upon what I see by the time series. Number three, FST, QST. And the fourth criteria is what I call trait-augmented marker-based approaches. So I have marker data, but the marker data aren't random markers. The markers are chosen because they're somehow involved in traits. They could be traits that are tagged for QTLs or for GWAS hits or other criteria. So again, the key thing is everything we talked about today, I've got to specify a trait. Yes, I use markers for FST. Here I use markers just by themselves, but I'm basically specifying a trait first then moving forward. On Tuesday and Wednesday, we'll talk about things which are trade independent, just using the markers. Then we'll come back on Thursday and Friday and talk about marker independent methods where I measure a trait and then measure, uh, 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 try to measure individual fitness and look for correlations between those. So <coughs> again, I gave you that overview of different approaches we can have to detect for selection. <coughs> this is kind of like a hybrid, and I basically have marker information that's based upon what I know about a given trait. So let's, the basic idea is to use, and there's a bunch of methods that use this idea. So this is a very powerful tool in genomics. <coughs> so use trait-associated markers, such as QTLs or GWAS, so I'll explain these quickly. And for example, is there a non-random distribution of the QTL or GWAS effects or frequencies? Um, so even though tests use markers, they are trait-specific. The key thing now is data are now categorical. How many QTLs go up, how many QTLs go down, and more importantly, <coughs> I look at a signature over the entire set of markers. So I have a set of markers, let's say height. I look at that entire set of markers and ask, is there a signature on that that leads me to suggest that it's not a random pattern, that it departs from drift? So I think when we develop these, it'll be a bit more clear. So here's an outline. I'm going to talk about OR had a couple of QTL tests. The first one is the QTL sign test of equal effects, then the QTL test. Then we'll talk about gas. That should be GWAS. <laughs> yes. Must have eaten at a Mexican restaurant the night before. GWAS-based test, genome-wide association studies. We'll talk about, for example, the T uh, SDS, which is singleton density score tests. We'll talk about uh, Berg, uh, Coop has a number of tests. Talk about the Berg Coop uh, QT test. It's the same as the T transpose T test. Then we'll look at applications, the genomic data, especially gene expression. So I think an example makes this a bit clear. Let's first of all, though, <coughs> remind you about QTL mapping. How many of you have heard about QTL mapping or know a little about it? <coughs> so I'll be relatively brief, but I won't be. I won't skip stuff. And I, if there's things you need to clarify, be sure and ask me. <coughs> The idea behind QTL mapping is really simple. It's linkage. It's often called linkage mapping. Can people see here without the light? I need to put the light on. 
They can see it through the light. So suppose I make the following cross. Big M, big M, big Q, big Q times little m, little m, little q, little q, m is a marker. So I have this in that. And then here, that's in the F1. In the F2, I get big M, that's 1 minus C over 2. I get big M, little q, that's C over 2. I get little m, big Q, that's C over 2. I get little m, little q, that's 1 minus C over 2. So C is a linkage. So for example, imagine tight linkage. I essentially only get this and that. <clears throat> and what that means is that if I then look in the F2s and I look at individuals carrying a big M versus individuals carrying a little m, they should differ in trait value. So Q-tail mapping is really simple. <coughs> I cross two inbred lines. Don't have to have inbred lines, but typically done. And then you're the F2. And in the F2, basically, I take everyone and I measure a trait. <coughs> then I look at markers. <coughs> so I look at the first marker on chromosome. So I've got, let's say, 100 markers scattered randomly over the genome. Look at the first marker on chromosome 1. Break individuals into homozygotes, heterozygotes, alternate homozygotes. Then do an ANOVA. Do those genotypes, those three categories, have different means? No, they don't. Then go to marker 2. No, they don't. Marker 15. Yes, they do. What that means then is marker 15 is near a segregating QTL. So if some individuals get big M, they get one QTL. Individuals get little m, they tend to get the other QTL. Therefore, when I break individuals based upon big M or little m, I see a difference in mean phenotype. That then tags a marker, and I can also use that difference to estimate a marker effect. More generally, when you see a QTL, you see something like this. Here are three traits, and you see these three curves. So trait number one, the solid curve, trait number two, the kind of dotted dashed curve, none of those are above the significance threshold, <coughs> and therefore there's no QTLs for those two traits on this chromosome. However, this is a, a likelihood plot. This QTL, this trait, does have a QTL. There's this most likely location. We can estimate its uncertainty by the spread, we can then remove it by putting it as a cofactor and ask if that peak is significant. So I can then scan through a whole bunch of chromosomes and basically find where there are markers which tend to co-segregate with traits. Again, those markers are not the underlying loci. They're usually within 20 centimorgans. So I have to say that Q-tail mapping is like taking the, the, the genome is the world. Q-tail mapping says, Congratulations, you're in the southeast US. It's a huge improvement over the world, but it's not very localized. GWA says, congratulations, you're in Georgia, right? So Q-tail mapping then allows us to find markers on chromosomes, and usually, you know, five to 10. There's lots of issues with Q-tail mapping. But the question is, how can we then use those data to do tests of selection? And Eleanor at Rochester, uh, was one that proposes. Alan's also done a lot of really very important work in adaptation. He's done a lot of stuff on Fisher's geometric landscape and, and uh, the Maynard Smith uh, uh, molecular space models. And his basic idea in the QTL sign test is I do a whole bunch of QTLs and I simply ask, is there an excess of plus or increasing alleles in the larger line? Now, Obviously, the larger line is going to have more plus alleles. And there are two different versions. The simplest version is the equal effects model, where all NQTLs are chosen to have equal effects. So if I take the larger line, obviously, it's going to have one or more extra plus alleles relative to the smaller line. Why? Because it's larger. There's ascertainment, but we correct for it. And we correct for it, basically, is we define this quantity here, which basically says that I've got at least one more plus QTL. And then the idea is this, that if I'm assuming I've got QTLs which are randomly scattered by chance, so that by chance one will have more, does one that have more have excessively more, given I've chosen that? The way to tell that 
is if they're scattered at random, each has a probability a half of getting it up, a half of getting it down. That's a binomial. And basically then, this is the chance of getting k up out of n. So here's the number that you expect for the high line. It's having n plus 1 or more. There's the probability of having n plus 1 or more. Suppose you observe 9. What's the chance of getting 9 or 10? So this ratio here, give an example in a second, allows you to adjust for the fact that the high line is going to have more plus QTLs. Given you've conditioned on the high line having more plus QTLs, is the amount of plus QTLs you see excessive? And this is called the sign test for equal effects. And a key part here, very key part, you need a minimum of six detected QTLs for the test to work. Why? Because with six detected QTLs, in over, the square of n at 2 is 4. So the high line must have at least 4. And if you then work out what that is, the most extreme would have 6. So having 6 for populations where you have 4 or more gives you about a 5% probability. If you have 5, it doesn't work. So your sample size here, n, of QTLs has to be at least 6. So very often people uh, basically lump traits together to get this magic number of 6. So let's look at an example of that. Everyone's favorite example, Drosophila genitalia. So basically, I mean, being a bug nerd, when you're trying to identify, for example, moths, a lot of them you can't identify from the wing characters. You have to look at genital features in the males or females because basically the genitalia are sclerotized and they've got all sorts of processes which differ between them and differ consistently. So people actually mapped QTLs and I've got Seychellia and uh, Mariana here. I'm not sure if this is the exact paper here. This is from Kathy Laurie's lab. And basically what they found was eight detected QTLs for the posterior lobe were antagonistic. And antagonistic means that um, the effects are in the opposite direction of the low line. So basically here, the high line had all of the QTLs B plus. Low line had no plus QTLs. You can then ask, what's the chance of that happening? Well, the high line out of eight has either five, six, seven, or eight. This is the probability uh, of them basically having it given you just, they're just high and random. That's the one you see. So probably is about 1%. So it's a significant excess. And again, whether or not equal effects are reasonable for this model, it's not an unreasonable way to go. So that's Orr's sign test for equal effects QTL. You condition on the high line having more QTLs, then you adjust accordingly. In a second, we'll talk about what happens if they have unequal effects. Okay. Yeah, I no, no, no problems. Sure. So a high line is aligned with a higher trait value. Okay. So for example, a larger posterior lobe. Yeah, so for example, the question is this. If you've got QTLs, and each QTL gives you an extra chunk of the posterior lobe, do you see an excess of plus alleles in the high line? And the tricky part, of course, is, well, the ply line is going to always have excess alleles, because if, you, if you have two lines and they're picked at random, the line that's going to be high is going to contain more. Well, that's the chance of it containing more. That's the chance of it containing all eight being there. So you can basically ask, given you condition on it to contain more, do you see an excess relative to what you expect or not? And the key feature here is the equal effects makes the math really easy because you're just doing accounting. Would you want to account for unequal effect sizes? That's Orr's QTL sign test. That's a bit different. We'll talk about that in a second. So people see the idea. I have a trait. I've done a QTL mapping. I then have two lines. One line's always going to be higher than the other. And the question is, in the high line, I expect more plus alleles. There's alleles that increase the trait value. But do I see an excess of those over what I expect? So this conditioning here is what you expect. That's the observed value. You can ask, is that an excess? In this case, it is. And the limitation is, you've got to have at least six QTLs. Because with six, the high line has four, five, or six. If you've got less than six QTLs, you've got no, you can't have a probability above five, less than 5%. Right? So people often love them. That's Orr's QTL sign test of equal effects. Okay? Very nice, very simple. 
Um, one of the issue is always ascertainment bias. So Eric Anderson and Monty Slatkin did a really interesting experiment. They basically simulated T identical and independent traits with 10 QTLs of equal effects and just threw the QTLs down at random, entirely neutral. Then in this set of, uh, where was it? Of 25, I think. In this set of 25, they then picked a trait that showed the largest divergence for the QST test. Again, for the, the so, sorry, so just like we saw in the QST, FST, if you choose a trait given this divergent, you've already biased it. So in this example here, um, if there were 10 QTLs picking the largest trait out of 25 they simulated, um, equation 10 gives a probability of nine or more plus alleles as about 3%. What they found though, when they took the most divergent out of the 25 traits and did that over and over again, that over 50% contained at least nine plus alleles. So ascertainment bias is a real issue if your trait is not random, but you pick the trait because it shows divergence, you've introduced a bias you haven't accounted for. The QTL scientist test adjusts for one bias, simply that the trait is, take the larger population is gonna have more. But here, the way to think about it is you've got basically 25 tries at it, and you pick the most extreme of those 25s. So it's not at all surprising you see this. So ascertainment bias is again an issue here in that before you do the experiment, you need to choose the traits and choose the way this independent of how much divergence they show and human nature is just not gonna let you do that. You're gonna choose traits because they're divergence. That's what people typically, typically do. So that's the QTL sign test of equal effects. Or's QTL sign test is a bit more general and that basically is I have a distance, difference I observe between the high and the low lines. Then I've got either the individual QTL effects or I have distribution of those effects. Then what I simply do is I sample those at random. And um, I condition on the number of plus alleles given the observed difference D. So I basically do a sample. If so randomly partition these, these QTLs I observed and look at the difference. If that difference is less than D, I throw that sample out, redo it again. If that difference is D or bigger, I keep that sample. I ask how many plus alleles there are. And I keep on doing this, I have a sufficient number of sample. And then I simply ask, is my observed number bigger than I expect under this null hypothesis? And you can do it a couple of ways. You can draw the effects from a common distribution that you estimate from the data, or you can draw them by a bootstrap. You put all your QTL values into a pot, unsigned, pick them at random, sign them at random, and put them back in. And so basically, this is a, a, a way of accounting for the fact that your QTLs may have unequal effects. This is called the QTL sign test. And the advantage of that is it accounts for some of the ascertainment you do. The disadvantage is, is it comes to the effect of power. So to adjust for ascertainment, it does the effects of power. Because this difference here provides much of the information about selection. So if you condition on that, you can have very little power. So you have this trade-off of the equal effect sign test, which is reasonable, but in scenarios where the, uh, the signs are quite different, you can use this more elaborate version, but the problem is by conditioning, you use a lot of the power of the test, and so very often it can be a bit underpowered. So these are both approaches then of using QTL data to ask whether the pattern you see is excessive relative to some random expectation. So an example, Lauren Reesberg at UBC, same department Mike Whitlock, basically used the equal effect sign test to do a meta-analysis, um, so see Appendix 4, um, of, of about 3,000 to 2,600 QTL effects from a bunch of traits and a bunch of studies. And basically what he did was he saw this. So antagonistic QTLs basically means you have an excess. So uh, what fraction of negatives are found in the positive line and vice versa? What you see is that ratio should be about a half if they're randomly distributed, a little bit under if you account for ascertainment. And 
which sees a bunch of things here. Plants, animals, inter, intra, outcross, self-life history. So there's a lot of conflicting and overlapping points in the data. So when you go to least squares mean, you put this all into NOVA and you break this out, what you basically see is you see weak signals for two of these. And the bottom line here was there seems to be suggestions. So all these are significantly different from the expectation when you account for ascertainment. Um, if you then adjust for the fact you've got overlapping data. So for example, something could be an animal, an outcross, and involving morphology, or plant, self, life history, phenology. So the least squared means basically put these in as ANOVA and remove those effects, and only two of those were marginally significant. The bottom line here though is you see significant departures over this entire analysis. And what he said was a lot of these differences were probably driven by directional selection. I think that may be a bit over interpretation, but certainly a very, very interesting data set. So two other examples which are a bit more concrete. So number one was, uh, let's go to tomatoes first. Here are trichomes, these little hairs in tomatoes. So what they were doing, Muir et al. was looking at QTLs in tomatoes, looking at leaf-related traits in wild species thought to be associated with adaptation to drought, precipitation, et cetera. They found no significant departure from neutrality for two leaf and two trichome traits, but significant departure for two stomatal traits. Another cute example, these are um, Lake Malawi cichlids. Cichlid fishes in the lakes in the Great Rift Valley in Africa have tremendous speciation. And so what the authors did here, Albertson et al., was they basically lumped together, because this factor of having six sites, they lumped together um, uh, feeding morphologies. So they found that only four of the 46 QTLs were antagonistic for John tree features. That is, of the 46 QTLs that were present, only four of them were plus in the down line. So again, highly significant. So these are, this is a meta-analysis using this approach. These are specific examples using specific cases. And again, it's one of many tools in your toolbox, in your arsenal. There are strengths and weaknesses to it. Uh, I think with genomic data, it may become a more powerful approach. But those are the basic ideas behind these sign tests. We will extend upon those in a second um, to GWAS approaches. But any questions so far? So I talked a little bit about kind of how you do a QTL analysis. That's kind of a different course, but I gave you an overview. Then I talked about the notion of if you have equal effects, if you condition on the large line, do you see an excess of plus alleles? Um, then I talked about the, the general sign test where you condition on the difference and ask conditioning on that difference, do you see an excess of plus alleles? We talked about a big problem is a trade-off between ascertainment and power. If you condition on the observed difference D, you have lower power. If you don't account for ascertainment, that is, I pick a trait, that trait's not random, I pick it because it looks different. If you don't account for that, you can also bias your results. So again, the basic approach is, I use markers, but I have a trait that, that then tells me which markers I should use. So I call these trait augmented marker-based approaches. I have a trait, then I have marker information, I look at some unusual patterns in that marker information. So we've so far done QTLs, nowadays people do GWAS, genome-wide association studies. Just to remind you what a GWAS looks like, the idea behind GWAS is QTL studies are problematic because they require you to make a cross, and usually the sample sizes aren't really big. Two to 300, that's terrible power. The uncertainty is huge. It's on the order of 20 to 40 centimorgans. Centimorgan is roughly a million, a megabase. A megabase has usually got a couple hundred genes in it. Not very informative. GWAS is based on the idea of linkage disequilibrium. So here is a marker. On a chromosome, this marker, by chance, a mutation arises. That mutation initially is only found on this marker. That's linkage disequilibrium. It's non-randomly associated. If that distance is tight, that non-random association will persist. If that distance is weak, randomization will take care of it. So mutations are going to generate LD for tightly linked sites. 
So if I score 100,000, 500,000, a million markers, and simply look at the entire population for marker trait associations, I can find them. So for example, here, this pixel here, right here, says at this position on, it looks like chromosome 12, there we are down here, at this position on chromosome 12, I basically take all my phenotypes, I break it into three categories. Homozygote one, heterozygote, homozygote two for my SNP marker, do an ANOVA, and then plot minus log 10 of the p-value. It's not significant. Go over here, minus log 10 is above this multiple corrections threshold, and then people like to point out things are exciting by putting an arrow and telling you what SNP they are because it's next to some gene of interest. Let me show you why that's complete. I believe the correct term is Bravo Sierra. Let's imagine how quantitative trait variation works, right? Most GWAS hits are not in coding regions. And this makes sense because the view of a lot of people, and a lot of people means more than myself, the view of a lot of people is most quantitative variation is regulatory. That is, the variation you see, genetic variation, isn't caused by different protein coding sequences. Certainly some are and they're dramatic. I'm not saying they're not. But a lot of that is caused by regulation. So instead of making a certain amount, you make more or less. Let's imagine the critical gene is right here. That's on chromosome one. Level of this expression of this gene, need a bigger ear, I guess. Level of this expression of this gene determines trait value. So subtle changes give you subtle changes in trait value. Your GWAS gives you a hit right here. Different chromosome. Why? Suppose that small RNAs are involved in regulation of that gene. The amount they bind controls regulation. Suppose over here, at a non-coding region, you have a new SNP. That SNP then takes that non-coding region and makes it a little bit closer to the consensus sequence of that small RNA. So now some fraction of that small RNA now comes over here and binds. This then is the site that influences expression of that gene that gives you the trait value. Your GWAS hit will be here. You have no freaking idea that's the target over there. And when you can do that, you can condition on levels of that expression if you know what that target is. So GWASs can be very misleading. And these little arrows about how exciting they are, you know, random hits are going to be near genes. You can always make a cute story about why a gene's important. But GWASs, if they're controlled by transacting factors, and a lot of them seem to be, they're non-coding regions, quite a bit away from other things, can be very hard to track down where they are because we don't know how to take a DNA sequence and give you definitive information about regulation. We're great about taking a DNA sequence and giving you a protein sequence. We can't give a DNA sequence and tell you how it's regulated. We're hopefully getting better, but we're still a long way there. So GWAS then, the thing about GWAS is you get a lot of hits, right? You get a lot more hits than a GWAS than a QTL, and the effects turn out to be a lot smaller, but also they're in smaller regions. A typical GWAS hit isn't on the order of 20 megabases, it's on the order of 5 to 10 kilobases. So you can now say, for example, that the genome is the world and we're now in Georgia. Heck, we're in the close coastal plains of Georgia. We're getting a lot closer to the, where the genes are. So those are GWASs. And then the question then is how can we use that GWAS data? Well, usually more GWAS hits than QTL hits for a given trait. And again, the key idea is to perform a test over a collection of markers for a given trait. So I have a trait. I then do a GWAS, or I've done a GWAS for a bunch of traits. I then look at the markers for the GWAS hit for that trait and ask some question about them relative to some neutral standard and ask if there's something unusual about them. Right? So again, it's a marker-informed trait-based test, but again, it requires me to specify the trait so I know what QTLs to use or what GWAS markers to use. Okay. Well, the simple way to do this is called GC. Don't you love an initials? Gene set enrichment. And the bottom line basically is you have some gene of interest or you've got a network of interest or you've got some gene ontology cluster. You basically 
take a set of markers in those genes and then contrast those with random markers. And this is like doing an FQST. You can ask for that set of genes, is there something unusual about them relative to random markers? And in here, what they did was they took basically a set of pathway connected genes, um, computed the average FST values for those, and contrasted that with an FST over the same set of putatively neutral markers. They did it over a bunch of pathways, and they found evidence that is higher FST values in those pathway genes for several pathways involved in pathogen response. So it's an interesting idea, except, except now the trait moves from being a specific trait to maybe a network, a set of interacting genes. So it's a much more genomics-based approach. Right, we're now moving entirely away from a trait, and we're asking, is there selection on this pathway? So again, pretty cool idea. Um, so that's where the trait was the pathway. Another example was the work on 140 GWAS hits in heights in northern versus southern European populations. Under neutrality, the lower frequencies of the plus and minus alleles should be randomly distributed, but they found that 85 of the 139 markers showed an increase for high alleles in the northern population. So again, a non-random distribution. This is a QTL sign test, but now based upon GWAS hits, I've got a lot more hits, 140, than I would in a typical QTL. So GWAS gives you smaller effect, but more hits. So you can do experiments like that. So there are other approaches you can use with GWAS. There's a method we'll talk about uh, probably tomorrow called the singleton density score method. And the basic idea is coming out of Pritchard's group at Stanford. It's how do you leverage whole genome sequencing? And one of the things you get from whole genome sequencing are unique alleles, right? So you and I, I got dozens of unique alleles. So one of the problems with a whole genome sequence in a GWAS is suppose that I was 10 feet tall and you genome sequence me and genome sequence you and I've, I've got a thousand SNPs, the alleles which are unique to me and not found in you. That's not unusual, right? We differ at 22 million SNPs between two random people. So me having a thousand unique that no one else has wouldn't be that unusual. What would the GWAS do? would take that 10 feet, that, you know, four and a half, five foot advantage and distribute it evenly across those 10,000 markers. So the signal would basically get diffused away. So how do you handle individual information? And what Pritchard's idea was, was kind of cool. You take a specific region, then you basically go out from that region and see how far you have to go out till you get a singleton. A singleton is an allele that's only found in that individual, no one else. And the idea is, you think about a coalescent tree, alleles near the tips are gonna only be found in one individual, alleles further down that when they occur are gonna be found in multiple individuals. So the singleton density score is basically a ratio of that distance in one allele versus that distance in another accounting for recombination. That kind of gives you an idea for you know, how unique or how rare or how common that allele is. And what you can then do is use that to basically estimate test of selection, as we'll talk about next time. But one of the nice things about using that is you can take that singleton density score for a given marker and then make it a trait-based approach. Because the singleton density score, as I presented it there, is simply scanning random markers independent of traits. That's a whole topic about genomic scans, we'll talk about the next two days. What um, the, the Pritchard's group did is they went a step further, they basically said, okay, let's take that singleton density score, and now we'll, we'll call it a trait singleton density score by basically giving it a sign. So the singleton density score, let's say, is six. If that's an increasing allele, it's plus six. That's a decreasing allele, it's minus six. Then you simply combine the scores for all the significant GWAS markers in a target trait and use that as a test statistic. So weighted by their score and the sign, is there an excess positive or excess negative? 
So again, the, the unique feature here is the metric, which is a singleton density score. But we're not using anything else about it. When they did this approach, they had really good success for detecting, for example, selection on female uh, 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 pelvic width in the last 300 years in England. It's a really interesting science paper. You should definitely check it out, 2016. One of the last things we were able to sneak into the book. Got it in just in time. Um, so the other thing is, this is based upon significant GWAS hits. Everything above some line based upon multiple corrections. Look at all the stuff down here. That's really relevant. Have people heard about the missing heritability problem? That is a complete crock. The missing heritability is because molecular biologists don't understand basic quantitative genetics. The missing heritability says, I take all the significant markers and I use them to compute the heritability. And for example, for human height, which has a heritability of 90% when you sex correct it, the markers accounted for a heritability of 10%. Where is all this missing heritability? The models must be wrong. No, it's a fact, you idiot. All these things down here, they're not above this incredibly stringent threshold, but they're still quite significant. If you put those into the marker, you now account for about 55%. The other is accounted for by the fact you never have perfect associations. So this whole missing heritability problem I find really interesting and annoying at the same time. So what, what Pritchard did was they said, well, let's just not take these, let's just take everything. And how do we take everything? It's pretty cool. So what they basically did, not it there, okay, oh, look at all this fun math coming up. What they basically did was they, to incorporate information from these non-significant markers, that is those below the threshold, potentially biologically interesting, what they basically did is they did regression. So they basically bend SNPs with similar GWAS scores and took the bin average as predictor variable and then regressed those on the TSD scores. So looking at the effects on TSD and basically ask if that significant regression is significant, you don't expect an association under drift, you don't expect an association under selection. When they did that, they found, for example, signatures for height, infant head size, body mass, female hip size, over the last couple thousand years in England. Very cool approach. Again, bending the markers based upon their association with a trait, and then asking is there something unusual about that collection of markers relative to a similarly chosen set of markers that wasn't chosen based upon information on some sort of traits. Those are the kind of standard trade-offs you use. Okay. Ah. Look at all those matrices. So, who feels pretty comfortable in their matrices here? Wow, I need an intervention here. So it's time for, once again, we'll call this Bruce's little sermon. If you look at how biologists are trained in mathematics, it's a weird set. It's mainly set by the physics and chemistry people having their way. So what do you typically take as an undergraduate in biology? We take calculus, and you occasionally take a differential equations course, and maybe an introductory stat course. They pat you on the back and kick you out the door. The most, calculus is always good to know, because that's kind of things you want to think about stuff. But the two most important things, mathematical techniques as a biologist are stochastic processes, that is probability and random processes, and matrices, because matrices are what you use all the time. Let me give you a quick, kind of quick and dirty matrix cheat sheet here. And by the way, if people want, and we can do it, I can always see if I can give a, an evening uh, uh, course on matrices. I know you'd be excited about that, but we can, if people are interested, we can, yeah, cause I have, I've got a can lecture I can pull up on that. Let me show you how to read some of these things. So one of the, one of the issues with these tests that uh, Coop has come up with and others is I want to account for the fact if I sample alleles from some populations, there'll be some structure. And that structure will be the form of some covariance matrix. So I have some covariance matrix. I think they call it, let's say, omega. Ooh, big fancy. But let's look at something different. Suppose I've got something look looking like this x transpose vx. What is that 
basically mean. So, roll. Actually, no, it's this here. Always get those mixed up. This basically gives you something looking like this. It gives you a sum of xi, xj, vij. That's called the quadratic product. And quadratic products arise when you've got the variance of a sum. So if I compute, for example, the variance of, let's say, um, x, make this here, make that a c. Hang on here. Try to keep my notation clean. So let's do this. <laughs> okay, so we'll go c, v, c transpose equals sum c, i, c, j, v, i, j for i and j. And what this basically is, that's the sum of c, i, x, i. So c1, x1 plus c2, x2 plus c, n, x, n. That's the variance for sum where v here, v, i, j is the covariance of x, i, and x, j. So quadratic products arise quite a bit in, in, in statistics because a lot of things in statistics, we've got a whole bunch of things which are correlated and then we basically make indices of those, weighted sums. What to ask what the variance of those weighted sums are, right? That's called the quadratic product. That's feature number one. Feature number two is if I have x, v inverse, x transpose, where x is normal with variance covariance matrix with, with a vector of uh, v and a variance cover a vector of means of zero and a variance covariance matrix, this thing here gives me the sum of n independent normals. What's the sum squared? What's the sum of n independent normals squared? It's a chi-square. So these things here follow chi-square distributions. That's an inverse. It's also something you might have seen before called the Mahalanobis distance. So a lot of the tests we'll talk about then have things that look like this. So what this basically does is it takes correlated data and this transformation takes that correlated data and makes it a sum of unit normal squared which makes it a chi-square distribution. So those are kind of some of the things we'll, we'll see momentarily. So Graham Coop and his students then, basically the idea about looking at marker effects. So here's the idea. This is now with a population with substructure. So here are the frequencies of a marker over M subpopulations. And I can basically write that distribution, multivariate normal, I have a vector of the original allele frequencies in the populations. Then this is the variance covariance structure and that basically tells me correlations among those different markers. So the Bayev test, which we'll talk about um, probably on Wednesday, is to test for a specific locus. So this is one way. Remember we talked about FST-based tests? Those are called lewinton krakauer tests. This is a third generation lewinton krakauer which accounts for population structure that the original lewinton krakauer did. The idea is that we can extend this to a trait-based test as follows. So I now have GWAS hits. So now I'm getting trait-based. So I can then take those GWAS effects and their allele frequencies, and then for each, um, so AJ says in population J, what's the specific effect from that marker? When you then put that together, you can then basically end up getting a test statistic that looks like this. That gives me a chi-square. That inverse of the population structure here basically removes correlations. So this is their QX, also called X transpose X test. They basically ask if I have a series of divergence among populations where I take a, I take a GWAS hits, I use those to compute basically genetic values, is that divergence excessive or not excessive relative to the information I have on the marker structure based upon random markers? We'll talk about this more when we talk about third generation tests. But you basically end up getting this test statistic. It's called the QK test statistic. And again, what it's now looking at is I have a trait 
over several subpopulations. I basically ask, this is again, essentially uh, a FQST type test, except now we're doing much more rationally about FST, I'm allowing for the fact that populations could be structured quite differently. Again, we'll talk about that uh, probably tomorrow. Um, so you can use th this test here or it's similar uh, X transpose X test, very similar in form. Um, and Robinson et al. apply these to body mass data and height for about 10,000 individuals. And they found suction favoring increased height and reduced body mass index. This is also super cool. This was now applied to 230 individuals where they got dead individuals they got ancient DNA from. And these individuals r range from about 6,000 to uh, 300 years before the common era, as people like to say. And using this sample, they could then report evidence of two independent episodes of selection for height. So one of the cool things that's coming out is getting good quality ancient DNA. That's a temporal time point a while ago. We can actually use that information. And a lot of the tests we'll talk about can use that information. So again, I, I went over this quickly because it's a little bit technical. And I realized I should probably present this after I talk about lewinton Krakauer tests. But the basic idea is I have marker data from a series of populations. I've got GWASs from a series of populations. I then simply take that and compute for a given trait what I expect the genetic values to be over those subpopulations and then ask if those are excessive or not excessive relative to population structure I see. And that's kind of what this thing does here. That's the population structure. That's the estimated marker effects from the QTLs. And that's basically the adjustment for it. So let's, uh, questions about that? I was a bit technical, all those matrices a bit late in the day. So I'm trying to give you kind of a quick overview. Um, all the gory details are worked out in the book if you're interested. So now let's take these and conclude by looking at divergence in gene expression levels. So one of, the, one of the really interesting things that's happened over the past decade and a half or so is that yeast has exploded as a model system for quantitative genetics. Yeast <laughs> doesn't have a lot of morphology, right? <laughs> kind of round, you know. Yeah, it makes beer, maybe it's a good side effect. But the way it's exploded is people have realized gene expression is a quantitative trait. The level of expression at all, you know, 6,000 or so genes, that's an important quantitative trait. And the nice thing is, by looking at all 6,000 odd genes, I'm getting a random sample. There's no ascertainment bias. So there's been a lot of work done on quantitative genetics of yeast gene expression because we're using gene expression as a model system for a quantitative trait. It makes sense. Gene expression is controlled by the environment. It's often controlled by numerous sites away from the target site. So a lot of work has been done on that. And this led to, if I look at quantitative variation which is changed over species, levels of expression, is that too much or too little relative to what I expect under drift? So now my trait doesn't now become shell width or head size, but my trait now becomes level of messenger RNA expression. It's just a number, you can certainly do that. And so this removes the ascertainment issue. One interesting thing we need to talk about really quickly is historically in genetics, cis versus trans, before it got applied to gender, has a very clean meaning. And cis is simply, I've got a DNA molecule and I've got a binding site on that DNA molecule that influences the expression of a gene on that molecule. Trans means I've got a diffusible factor. So it could be on the homolog or somewhere else that then diffuses and acts on that. So cis and trans have these very clean meanings going back to Minot well, with lac operon. They're also unfortunately used by people looking at GWAS hits. These are called eGWASs. So if I'm looking at a gene, let's say a gene at this position on chromosome one, looking at the expression in that gene, if I get a GWAS hit very near that gene, it's very often called cis. If I get a GWAS hit far away from that gene, it's very often called trans. That's a bad use. The better use is local versus distant. If I get a site, a GWAS hit that's 
in the vicinity of that gene, I'm going to call it local. I don't know if it's cis or trans. I just know that it hits locally. It could be a transacting site. But if it, we call it local versus distance. So well, those will come up in a second. Then we want to talk about allelic specific expression. You can actually look at individual alleles if they have different sequences and ask, are there differences in expression levels? So if I have differences in expression levels of the two alleles, it's probably cis effects. Why? Because the trans effect, you're going to expect them both equally. So we'll come back and talk about local, distant, and these, because these are used in some tests that people put together for selection. So to remind you, and the reason I put this in here is that right now a lot of this focuses on gene expression. But one of the, the revelations that's been very important is genomic level features, messenger RNA level, levels of protein, metabolite levels, those are quantitative traits. I can measure them, I can look at variation among individuals, I can look at between population differences. So one of the things that's really kick-started quantitative genetics is the realization that all these genomic features are actually quantitative traits. And one of the classic ones is levels of gene expression. And so here, the amount of RNA at a candidate gene is the quantitative trait. So what I do is I focus on a gene. For example, alcohol dehydrogenase. I look at expression levels in ADH. And then what I do, for example, is I ask, okay, are there genes that influence the expression level of this gene? There may be sites which are nearby. Those are often called cis in the literature, but the better term is local. We don't, we don't know if they're acting in a cis faction, acting as a binding site, or in a trans faction, acting as a diffusible site. There are also sites elsewhere. The very first paper to look at these expression level traits was a very, yeah, question. No, no problems. Not necessarily, but so basically trans refers to the fact that I make a diffusible factor. So for example, I make something that binds to it. So I literally could, if this is ADH, I could have a transacting factor coded for right here. And one way to tell, for example, is using allele-specific expression. If I've got a fast and a slow ADH, those basically were, are defined by ADH alleles that have a nucleotide substitution in them. So I can score you for fast and slow. If I see that fast is differentially expressed in you, that means there's a cis-acting factor on fast. Because if you have a fast and a slow allele, trans-acting factors are going to affect them both equally. Right? So if you've got, so if I, have, if I have a fast and a slow and I see different levels of expression, it has to be a cis-acting factor in you because a trans-acting factor would act on both of those. Now the trans acts on a cis site, but the difference giving it is, is the cis site. And the reason I use local versus distance is in the early days of messenger RNA expression level mapping, people would take sites near the target gene and call them cis, and take sites further away, either on the same chromosome or on different chromosomes, and call them trans. Cis and trans is an operational definition. So the better term is local, nearby, and distant. That gives you information about proximity, not information about how they actually act. But remember, DNA is really funky. If I've got a, think about a rope that's, you know, well, give me some idea how big DNA is. Suppose I take a cell in you and make it the size of a basketball. How long is your DNA? Take a guess. I take a cell in you and make it the size of a basketball. How long is your DNA? Solar system Earth, you guys are thinking too big. It's 100 miles. It's big, I mean, you're right, it's big, but, and, and so, if you think about then, take a chromosome from that, a typical chromosome would say be eight miles long. It's an eight mile long piece of wire. Well, the problem is that piece of wire is all folded up. So a site way over here, six miles different from I am, could actually loop around and bind and actually be quite important. So proximity on DNA is weird because the topology is not given by the linear distance, it's given by when that molecule folds, what it's like. And DNA is very good at finding complementary sites, so very often a complementary sequence over here will fold and in, 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 in be involved in the regulation of a gene. So regulatory sites can be way, way, way distant and still, in a sense, act in kind of a cis fashion. But the very first paper then that, that, that looked at these expression level QTLs 
was a very nice paper in Mays in the 90s, a, a group in France. And what they did was they basically took uh, a Mays ear, ground it up, and ran it on a 2D gel electrophoresis, basically a big slab of jelly. And they put current in one direction, I think it was acidity in the other direction. When you do that and turn on the current, proteins of different size and charge start to spread. You can then stain it and you see blobs. And the nice thing about the blob, if you have reference blobs, the position of those blobs gives you information what protein it is. They're anonymous, an, uh, anonymous proteins because we don't know what they are. So what they did was they took these, you know, several hundred ears, did these experiments, and they noticed that some ears had different spot sizes. Well, the spot size is the amount of gene expressed, the amount of protein expressed. So differences in these spot sizes basically gave you differences in level of expression, and they actually were able to map QTLs that were involved in giving you small spots or large spots. A really cool idea, and it just impresses on the fact that quantitative traits are basically anything you can measure. We think about height, weight, yield, morphology, but they could be molecular features we can put numbers on. If you can put numbers on a trait, it's a quantitative trait. So I think one of the things that's made quantitative genetics you know, much more interesting in the genomics era is people realize that genomics features are quantitative traits. It's just not height or weight, but it's a feature influenced by a number of genes and by the environment. By definition, that's a quantitative trait. So, uh, one of the nice things I mentioned about using messenger RNA uh, is you can, for example, take a yeast cell and look at all 6,000 genes. That right away gets you away from ascertainment bias. If you're trying to ask what is a typical gene like, well, if you measure traits, you have already have some bias in picking those traits. With expression levels, you're looking at basically 6,000 different traits. The expression level here is for a given gene. That's our trait. So if we've got 6,000 genes, I've got 6,000 potential candidates. So we'll see what happens then when you look at, whoops. So how can you test for whether I've got, let's say, two species of Drosophila, I measure expression levels. How can I ask if those expression level differences are either consistent with drift, consistent with stabilizing selection, or consistent with directional selection? And the way to do it is do a modification of Landy's test. And in Landy's test, um, this is the equilibrium version, so the between line variance is basically given by twice the time times the mutational variance for your target trait, in this case expression of a target gene, and the standing level of variation you express in that, that's the uh, equilibrium level in a drift and mutation. And so both these estimates follow chi-squares, so if you look at the ratio of those two, what you'll notice is the specific value for each gene cancels. And what you're left with then is for any given gene, since the mutational variance differs over those genes because they've got potentially different number of target sites, that cancels. And what you're then left with is an expression that simply depends upon this ratio, which you expect under neutrality to be constant over all genes. So the nice thing about this test is you get a single test statistic. It's a ratio of two scaled chi-squares, which makes it an F-test. It's basically independent of the gene. Why? Because gene-specific mutational features appear in the between and the within variants, and those cancel out. So then basically I can construct an overall critical value for those. And when you do that, basically here are the details. So Rifflin's group looked at melanogaster, uh, four inbred lines, one inbred line of simulans, one inbred line of Drosophila eucuba. So they could use the four inbred lines of melanogaster to get an estimate for the within line variation. And they were assuming that basically stays the same over the three species. Then you can compare melanogaster and simulans, melanogaster and eucuba, and basically they'll get between line differences. They looked at about 13,000 genes, and about 52% showed expression level changes in one lineage, um, comparing Melanogaster, Simulans, and Yucuba. For under 5,000, they couldn't reject the idea that the distribution were all draws, the, the, the changes were all draws to the same distribution. In other words, simply sampling in. Um, 
And because of that, they're deemed to be evolutionarily stable and therefore under stabilizing selection. You expect them to drift. If they all are indistinguishable from coming from the same distribution, they haven't drifted. So of this set of genes, about, 40, about, about a little under 5,000 were under stabilizing selection. You take the remaining genes in this set, and they sh showed no significant variance across melanogaster, but significant differences in melanogaster from the other species. So because no difference here, differences between species, they're deemed to be under lineage-specific selection. Then you have the remaining subset of this, uh, of this uh, uh, genes that show some expression differences. You then apply those 530 genes to the criteria that basically were developed here, critical values on that based upon the ratio of the between divergence versus within divergence. And what you basically then found was of those, where's the bottom line? Yeah, so you can basically get critical values. There are the critical values for comparing melanogaster to simulans, melanogaster to Yacuba, and basically they found that of the 530 genes, once you remove stabilizing selection, once you remove lineage specific selection, most of those were consistent with drift, and then 63 were consistent with excessive divergence. So again, there's details here in terms of crunching it through. The important thing aren't the details because you can go back and look that up. The important feature about this is showing you in your toolbox how you can use some of these results we've developed before to go back and develop tests for specific uh, 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 questions of interest. In this case, looking how messenger RNA diverged. So basically, this is applying messenger RNA data and simply treating it like a mean. We can also do sign tests, QTL sign tests for these. So before I do that, just one more thing. So there's, you can have kind of two models for how um, RNA, might, uh, RNA expression levels might change. One is Brownian motion, kind of randomly moves around. The other is Ornstein Ohlenbeck. Ornstein Ohlenbeck is Brownian motion with a rubber band so the further you are away from the origin or some critical point, the more the restoring force back. Ornstein Ohlenbeck is kind of a model for stabilizing selection. So what you can basically do is you can look at, and people have looked at uh, data in the great apes and data in Drosophila, and ask whether that divergence pattern is better fit by Brownian motion or by Ornstein Ohlenbeck. The difference is Brownian motion, the between line differences diverges linearly, Ornstein, Ohlenbeck, the between line differences asymptotes and comes to some value. And early on, there was a lot of arguments that in primates, the data evolved mostly in a neutral fashion. And part of that, and chapter 12 covers this in detail, part of that was based on the technology. So people were using human probes to look at divergent level differences between humans, chimps, apes, and orangutans. And the problem was, is when you don't have complete sequence complementarity, you get lower amount of binding, and that basically de facto shows more divergence because the expression levels, if they were identical, would change because the amount of binding changes. And so a lot of the early studies that seemed to suggest a linear increase were mainly driven by the fact that they had a poor technology, and they weren't actually capturing the amount of divergence, they're capturing divergence based on a probe, and that probe is going to linearly diverge from other species over time. When you look at it more properly, the, the take home message seems to be that the vast majority of genes that show divergence seem to follow Ornstein Ohlenbeck, that is, they're under stabilizing selection. The caveat with that is we mentioned you can get this Ornstein Ohlenbeck like uh, notion where divergence reaches a, a limit, it doesn't continue to expand by either having stabilizing selection or by having a mutational model. If your mutational model is not the incremental model, take your current level of expression and add on a random amount. But rather, you have something like a car house of cards. Your new mutation is a random draw, so your new expression level is independent of your current expression level. That model also gives you an asymptote. So the general consensus is it seems to be stabilizing selection, but you can't formally rule out the mutational model is not the incremental model. It's a detail, but, but an important detail. So now we can take the same data and do sign-based tests, right? And so sign-based tests, well, 
we have studies that go in and can basically look at what are called EQTLs. Here's a gene on chromosome four. I have an expression level. I can then basically go and look at all the sites that influence that and then do an, a, an OR sign test on those. Remember OR sign test? If I look at the gene with a higher expression in two lines, is there an excess of plus alleles given I've conditioned on it being higher? So one example of that, here's Saccharomyces cervicii budding, these are some bud scars. And so uh, a group out of Stanford looked at Saccharomyces cervicii and uh, a related species. And what they did was this requirement of having six QTLs or more to have any power, they got around them basically lumping things that were in similar expression sites. And so uh, the second thing they did is they used genes that showed allele-specific expression. The part about that is if I have an expression level change, if it's caused by a transacting factor, one transacting factor could influence a large number of genes. A cisacting factor only influences the gene it's on. So by focusing on alleles that show allele-specific expression, I'm restricting myself to cisacting factor. I'm getting a more accurate count of what's actually going on out there. So what they then basically did is the same thing we talked before about getting a set of genes, either because they're in a common pathway or they do a common thing that is they share a gene ontology criteria. You look at that set and compare that set to a comparable randomly chosen set, and what you saw was an excess in the set based upon certain pathways. So they found over 100 genes with evidence of lineage-specific selection in here. Another clever thing you can do is suppose I have genes that have cis factors and trans factors. If the divergence is entirely random, if a gene has an up-acting cis factor and also has a trans-acting factor, you'd expect that trans factor to be up or down roughly equally. Right? You should expect no correlation between genes that have both cis and trans factors. You should expect no correlation in the direction between those if it's neutral. If it's under selection, you expect a correlation. So you can kind of do that experiment, and what they basically did was they took two yeast strains that diverged about uh, 10 million generations ago, so about three weeks for yeast, just kidding, and they found that roughly about 240 genes had an excess where uh, if they had a, an up cis, they had too many up trans. So again, this is kind of a sign-based test, and what you're looking at is you're looking at two different features. Under neutrality, you expect those features to be random. If I'm up in cis, I should be up or down in a trans factor acting on the same gene. If I see genes that have an excess of both cis and trans up or cis and trans down, more than I expect by chance, that's evidence that something other than drift is shaping those. Now, one thing that can shape it is you can often have, when you have mutations in expression, they tend to be down mutations. But you can adjust for that, and the authors did that. So the other way to think about that, that that's again comparing cis and trans. You can also then do, this is the mcdonald kreitman approach we'll talk about a little bit later on today. You can then look at uh, polymorphisms in cis and trans, and cis and trans divergence. So I've got data within a species, data between species, the ratio of polymorphism to divergence should be the same for cis and the same for trans. If they're not, that's evidence of selection. So again, you've got a simple chi-square test. And we'll talk more about these type of tests later on. This is the mcdonald kreitman test. But the bottom line is the pattern of polymorphism to divergence differs over cis and trans. You don't expect to differ over cis and trans if things were entirely neutral. And the last one is basically a gene expression study. So the point is, you can take expression level data and you can apply some of these uh, tests. You can think of it as a fossil and look at divergence in means. You can think of it as sign test and look for an excessive number of pluses or minuses, either within a gene if it's got a large number of controlling factors or by grouping sets of genes that have similar pathways and then comparing that set of genes in the pathway with some other randomly constructed set and asking if there's an, there's an excess. Methylation, absolutely, sure. Acetylation, methylation, 
So if, simple rule is, if I can measure it, it's a quantitative trait. Because it's going to have measurement error, it's probably affected, even if it's only affected by a single gene, or no genes at all, you can still use the machinery of quantitative genetics. So if you can put a number on it, it's a quantitative trait. And the example I, I like to, to, to give, which dates me, so let's see how old people are. Anyone rem remember the game Grand Theft Auto? A couple of people. It's basically this game where you go around and you get points by getting tattoos and beating up bad guys and running away from the police. So it's a random game. I could take your performance on that game and ask what the heritability is. How would I do that? I take parents and offspring <coughs> and look for correlations. I would have to adjust for age factors and stuff. But that's a, that's a completely made up trait, score on Grand Theft Auto. But since I can put a numerical value on that, that's a quantitative trait and I can measure it. And I can ask about, do you have, is there a heritability in the ability to score well in Grand Theft Auto? It's obviously a trait that's not been under any evolutionary forces for it itself, but it could be things like on reflexibility or, uh, you know, focus and things like that. So anything I can put numbers on is a quantitative trait and I can apply these methods. Yeah? How much does it matter that expanding classic definition of I mean, like a quantitative Well, it means, it means, what? Oh, no, but see, see, you just don't, be, don't, be so, don't be so provincial. Quantitative is the big tent. Yeah, but that's, I'm asking the big, big tent. I mean, does it oh, no, it does. It, the not at all. No, quantitative just basically says you have a gene, you, so you have a trait that's influenced by both genetic and environmental factors. Epigenetics is a gene by E interaction, right? Do I have, uh, let's take a phage lambda. Do I have Crow or C1 bound to my expression site? That determines if I'm lytic or lysogenic. That's a big deal. There's no genetic variation, but there's environmental variation. And you can treat all the... the you don't have to have additivity. No, no. This, uh, this, this idea about additivity... So remember, additivity says you take what your gene action is, then you do the best linear fit on that. So when I talk about an additive effect of a gene, that's a statistical construct. Um, this analogy either makes perfect sense or makes things even further. Think about a complex function in a small area. Additive effect is a first order Taylor series. It's a local approximation. You've got to continually adjust that local approximation as you evolve, but additive effects are what parents pass on to offspring. That additive effect changes as the gene composition changes frequency alleles, et cetera. So I don't have to have that the gene action is additive. Don't need that at all. That's because you do, that's because Faulkner waters you down. Read Lynch and Walsh. We'll show where the bodies are buried. No, it's not. No, 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 no. So, so basically, quantitative genetics is a local approximation. But it's also the correct local approximation. If you give me the entire genome sequence of a mouse and all the gene networks and everything. The way I would apply that is I'd look at additive effects. Additive effects doesn't mean the trait, the, the genes underlying the effect are additive. Additive effects are what's the best additive approximation for alleles one at a time. And what you can basically sh show is that uh, if you look at allele frequencies, allele frequencies tend to follow something called the Watterson distribution, which means they're either really rare or really common, not much in the middle. When you have extreme allele frequencies, even with lots of epistasis and lots of dominance, almost all your variation loads onto additivity. So the cartoon version of quantitative genetics is everything is additive and it makes life, that's, that's how we sell it to the public so it's understandable. In reality, it's not additivity, the genes actually being additive. What matters is the approximation of treating each allele's additivity is basically how we tell about how parents and offspring resemble each other. And the approximation works better and better as you have more and more loci, not more and more additivity. I can have a cr crazily non-epistatic, very non-linear system, 
and approximate it very well with additive genes. And by approximate it, what I mean is predict how relatives should resemble each other, predict what's going to happen under inbreeding, predict what's going to happen under selection. So the additivity is an approximation, but it's, the approximation is generated by nature. Nature doesn't give on the whole genotype, it gives on single alleles. And the effect of those single alleles then is a statistical measure, and that statistical measure we call the additive effects of a gene. And there's a lot of subtleties buried in it, but, but the bottom line is you can apply quantitative genetics to all the traits I've talked about with complete confidence. Yeah? No, no problems. That's a great question. That's a, not simple at all. So suppose that um, there were two genes that influenced height. And one of them, if you have both copies, your height is six feet. The other, if you have both copies, your height is five feet. The, you get then, whether it's added or not depends upon what the heterozygotes look like. If you're five and a half feet, the genes are additive. If you're five feet, 10 inches of the heterozygote, and you have dominance. So the gene action isn't additive. However, I can ask if you get one of those tall alleles, what's the average effect if you transmit that allele? That depends upon the allele you transmit and the population you're transmitting it to because the average effect of that allele depends upon the frequencies of alleles, what it matches up with. So we talk about the additive effect of a gene. That means if I pass that gene on to you in a particular population, how much above or below the population mean are you if you have that? It doesn't mean that the underlying genetic model is additivity. It's a very good question. Yeah, I, I, I kind of went through these things. These are things we really flesh out more in a real quantitative genetics course, but I'm kind of giving you the cartoon version. Just like I'll give you the cartoon version of population genetics in a couple minutes. But great questions. I mean, that, those are the things that, which are really good for clarification. So both of them were excellent questions. Other questions or comments? My goal is to get a question or comment out of every single one of you before the class is over. It means I've done a good job. So that wraps up the first category of tests, actually two categories. Number one is trait-based. So I use simply divergence in the means to ask whether that's excessive or not relative to drift. The second one is what I call uh, trait augmented marker tests. I look at some features of markers, but those aren't random markers. Those are markers chosen because I give you a specific trait. So for example, QST, FST, I use markers to compute FST, an average population structure. I then use QST to compute variances for a specific trait, ask if there's a discordance. Or I could have things like a QTL sign test where you give me a trait, height, weight, I then use markers associated with that trait and ask those markers associated with that trait are different from some other random set of markers. So in both those cases, I have to specify a trait to proceed. That's powerful because you're often interested in traits. 